Let's talk a little bit about um, your husband would get into these drunken stupors and yeah. he would start running his mouth and yeah. tell you everything he knew. Yeah. Um, what did you find was uh, some of the most stunning revelations that, uh, that came? Um, I, besides the, the fact that he admitted he couldn't be a Christian and was an existentialist and explaining what existentialism meant to him, which was startling to me, um, the, the other uh, parts of some of the things he told me, which, which really startled me and frightened me, was his attitude towards murder, which he said was not murder, because he said uh, emotions are not involved. Mm. Um, his, his cold, calculating view of the destruction of, of innocent human beings meaning nothing to him, having mm -hmm. absolutely no, um, no feelings about ordering others to do that. Now, did he ever carry out some of these murders himself, do you think? Oh, of course, yeah. Um, in fact, he told me about Malcolm Kerr's murder. Malcolm Kerr, who's that? Malcolm Kerr was a British double agent who, was, who worked in California. He was uh, one of these joint, uh, these intelligence operatives who worked for both sides. Okay. And he had been in California, but he was um, doing intelligence work in Beirut undercover. He was the head of the American University of Beirut, AUB, which is in um, Lebanon. Okay. Now, my husband was the liaison between the White House and President Jamal, the, the second, the brother of the first president who was murdered. Mm -hmm. um, my husband was involved with assassinations and operations. Okay. He was very upset with Malcolm Kerr because Malcolm Kerr refused, although they were already there, the Marine snipers, the assassins, who were under my husband and General Joy, and uh, Al Gray, of course, were hiding in the, in the dormitory at this university. And, of course, General Gray, General Krulak, General Wilhelm, now Charlie Wilhelm was there. He is now my husband's special boss. And they were undercover there, and they had Malcolm Kerr murdered, simply because Malcolm Kerr would not allow the Marines to stay in the dormitory. Had I been Malcolm Kerr, I wouldn't have wanted uh, rowdy Marine assassins living in a dormitory with um, children, essentially, adolescent, young children, having set, you know, with their perversion and some of their, their behaviors. So he was, he was put away for that very reason, George told me. The, then there was um, Did, you, did Dale he give Dorman. you any uh, details about how he was killed? Um, no, he, he told me that he had to be gotten rid of because of that. He then said that, and oh, this is interesting, Mary Clark Yost Halab is, my husband is handled by her. She is a, an American double agent who was put on my husband's case because she could handle him. They had an affair, well, of course, while my husband was first married. Um, I found out about it because she called the house after we were married and wanted to talk to him. And I found in his papers a photograph of her and her bio and all kinds of information on her and her address in his address book. And I have, I want you all to see that on, in this movie. I, okay. I have a photograph of her. They had a long-term affair um, the whole time he was in Beirut 
while she was married to an Arab intelligence double agent who was underneath Malcolm Kerr. Okay. And who took over when Malcolm Kerr was murdered by them. So what you have here is a favor essentially done to Yost. She was Yost. She's from Louisiana. She, Baton Rouge, uh, New Orleans. How did she enter the intelligence picture? Was she recruited well, from school? She, yeah, she was at, um, um, trying to think. I, I have her bio. Um, okay. English major, uh, written books on British literature, um, Phi Beta Kappa. Um, she went to the American University in Beirut. She married a an administrator there who became, because of her position, you know, they love the mixed marriages. Um, he was Mixed second marriage in the sense of? For the double agents. If you marry, if an agent marries an agent of from another, another country. Yeah, they, yeah. they love that. The uh, intelligence community love that. The State Department loves that. And I was mentioning um, earlier that about the State Department, uh, when I was living with Sarah McClendon, helping her um, in, in 1986, I went everywhere she went because she's the senior national uh, White House correspondent. And I went to the State Department one day because I was curious about why there isn't peace in the Middle East. And I wanted to go to what I thought was the Middle East Department. Well, I, there was a group of students, and I got a, a press pass ostensibly to go in and mm -hmm. interview them. So I left them and f meandered up to the uh, Near East section. Mm -hmm. And I had quite a few hours. I thought they were going to, you know, say, what are you doing here? Because mm -hmm. all the doors were open. They had these little um, buttons on each door, you know, that they could have closed and you could have had to have known somebody to get in, which I think is terrible, to have the American people not know and not be allowed into the State Department without a special Sarah McClendon. If I hadn't had been living with the senior White House correspondent, I as a citizen would not be welcome at the State Department. Now, if they're interested in peace, and they're interested in, in that kind of thing, they're certainly not showing it by the closed door policy. Mm -hmm. So I went in, there were about, oh, eight or ten offices. I went in every single one. I was looking to find out who the um, leaders were. I knew about Aaron David Miller. I knew about um, David Satterfield, who really wasn't David Satterfield. His family were uh, Zionists who changed their name to David Satterfield, who was a Virginian uh, senator mm -hmm. back in the 30s, who had a wonderful name. It's like Jonathan Pollard. He took the name Pollard, which wasn't his name because of Governor Pollard. I was married to Governor Pollard's grandson for 21 years. They, they take the names of honorable people, and then they're not honorable. And, and what was his name previous to Senator Hoyt? He lived, um, uh, now Aaron David Miller, I think that is, Possibly his name, it might have been Mule. And I'm not saying that just because mm -hmm. they changed the name, they're bad. Right. Um, but what I am saying that there is this idea that go ahead and change it and be somebody else, kind of a snake, you know, uh -huh. changing colors for the moment, not being honorable and truthful, um, saying my family is Rosinski. Heck, I'd be Rosinski, you know. I'm, I'm the eighth Catherine in a row from Scotland. It's ridiculous. <laughs> But my daughter's Catherine and my granddaughter's Catherine. We're just, you know, it's a family tradition, weird, mm -hmm. but we're happy with that. Um, so um, David Satterfield, the reason I went there was because in the spring I went to an, uh, a dinner. It was either a dinner or a luncheon that the um, World Affairs Council had in, in Norfolk. And he was speaking. Mm -hmm. And I'm very interested in peace, because as a Christian, sure. I want it. I know it's possible if people are reasonable. And this talk that, that uh, 
David Satterfield gave, there were probably 20 mentions of Israel to one of the Palestinians. He was extremely biased, arrogant. The arrogance is what bothers me because you can't have peace, you can't have justice where there's imbalance. Um, and even that comes from the Greek furies, you know, the, the, the female who holds the, the, the justice. Women understand balance and justice. And women know, mothers know, if you show favoritism towards one child, the house is, that, that child, the other child's not going to be normal the rest mm. of its life. So a wise mother is, is fair and tries to be balanced, as most families do that are, that are balanced. Well, after having heard the bias and so forth, and then seen other people who were involved at the State Department in Norway when I was there, when my husband was doing some weapons deals with, with um, um, uh, Newt Igum and some of the State Department people under the table when we were supposedly going to Moss for the mayor and her husband and George were doing some deals. He's, a, he's sort of a pilot and, you know, there's a lot going on between Norfolk, Virginia Beach and Norway and weapons deals and so forth now because of what they set up in the spring of 95. So I went into the State Department um, Near East section and found there was not one single Palestinian, not one single um, Muslim, religious, uh, Saudi, you know, Jordanian, not one Christian Protestant, hmm. not one Roman Catholic, not one plain old American, whatever, from Corn Punk. Every single person in all of those offices were either Zionist, Israelis, whatever, and they had pictures all over the wall of Israel, Israel, Israel. They had magazines, Israel Today. You know, I was given a copy of one. Um, and there were yarmulkes, you know, mm -hmm. and in the... Uh, uh, Israeli writing. In other words, and I, I asked one of the women after having gone through about, you know, four or five of these offices, I said, because I was pretending like I really, you know, wanted, I was just kind of wanting to know where, where the Palestinian office was, you know. She said, well, we handle all of that. We handle all of that. And this so, is the State Department, the... Near East. The, the part that handles Israel, Jordan, okay. all of these. Egypt. Yeah, yeah. the Near East section. Uh -huh. Yeah. It was just totally dominated by... Totally. Israeli. Totally. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the spokesman, I can't remember his name, he was a, a Zionist, the spokesman for the whole State Department. Mm -hmm. Of course, we know that, and I'm not saying that... Matt, uh, Madeleine Albright is doing a bad job because I feel as though being a woman that she is definitely a lot more balanced <coughs> than Weinberger when he was there, Eagleberger, uh, Schultz, or any of them. Uh, because I feel as if she's trying to do it, but she's not strong enough. There needs to be a um, fairness in the State Department, mm -hmm. because all the weapons sales under the table are going through the State Department. That's why Ron Brown was murdered. Ron Brown tried for the first time to take away the unfair St uh, State Department monopoly on illegal weapons and drugs, drug deals. Because the weapons, the, the drug money is paying for the weapons. The, the brand new weapons are sold by agents of, of Israel or this... this now, is, this, is this a conclusion you've drawn based on your knowledge of this? Yeah. Gorbafar, Gorbachar, whatever the guy's name is. Bonifar. Um, Gorb, yeah. Gorbanifar. Yeah. Gorbanifar. And one of the, 
it was either he, him, or um, my husband worked with him. Um, my husband was the one who uh, was chief of staff under Al Gray when North was moved from the Atlantic Command to the National Security Council. Ollie North. Ollie North. And when you work in the White House, you work under the Army. They, the Marines have no overlord as such. They are, um, they can float, they can be truck drivers and still be 4th Marine, but they're run out of New Orleans, just like Oswald was. See, Oswald was homosexually recruited by Clay Shaw, David Ferry, that whole, you know, the New Orleans, Meyer Lansky, I don't mean, My, well, Meyer Lansky's guy, uh, Jack Rubenstein, who was Jack Ruby. Um, See, all of the funding for these operations go through the joint, the mob. And Oswald's mother had moved to New York, and he had gotten under this Zionist psychiatrist. I can't remember his name. But they, he came down to, to check on him. He was brilliant, but he wasn't motivated. He wasn't told he was special. He, his dad died or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, his father was, was, was a, uh, you know, I believe uh, a German soldier. But the, the point is, Oswald was a loner, brilliant, and a perfect candidate. He and my husband's profile are just, a, in fact, they almost look alike. Hmm. And... Um, you so mean their profile in terms of their background, psychological not profile. their physical profiles. Yeah, even even their they look a lot alike. Hmm. Yeah, and what's interesting is they always that, allege that uh, he had a double. Well, Couldn't you have see, been your this husband. is interesting. My husband, when I saw him in June, after his having lived with me that fall, he was different, a different facial everything than the man I married. The man I married and the man I saw in June were one and the same. Had a fuller face, mm -hmm. um, the, the mouth, you know, the, the, the mouth was fine. But the, the man that I was with, and it, 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 I know that it, I, I felt it was not the same person. Now, I don't think he could have gained that much weight in just a few months. Um, because he was very thin and, you know, it, now I, I could be just, um, but, but women sense things. I, I don't know how to explain it. And I talked to a good friend of Marina Oswald's who, um, knows that her husband was a patsy. Um, and I talked to another woman in El Paso who was in the book, The Widows, whose husband was a, a German, or rather a Czechoslovakian, whose father and two brothers had come over here as mercenaries, like all of these young men are still doing mm -hmm. today. And the father sent for the little boy and his sister, leaving the mother back in Czechoslovakia. Evidently, she had had an affair or something, but she was banished. I think they do this on purpose, though, because I'm finding that the boys identify with their mothers. They don't bond so much with the fathers, and they are their mother's keeper in that country. Mm -hmm. Now, I've talked to an Indian who had this situation, a, a little boy from um, Haiti, and a young boy from Romania. Each and every scenario was the same. The mothers were back there. They were given five years to become an American citizen as they were mercenaries. They had to do things that made one of them cry on the bus. And he told me what, mm. what was done when they did a hit. They did, there was one man who did things that were just horrible, and he said, I want to get out, but I can't. And this is horrible, to put young men who are strict Roman Catholics, you know, they've got that, that background, and mm -hmm. bring them over here and make assassins of them, or, in other words, to, to turn them in a five-year period 
and for the taxpayers to pay for this. These young men are training with SEALs. They may have a, a mother who's an American and a father who's French. Um, so they can go both ways. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they're not under the, the laws of the United States, so they can go do the actual um, murders or whatever. And Oswald, in Oswald's case, um, if you remember, he was, uh, he didn't have any problem getting into the Soviet Union. Right. And he went into the State Department on a Saturday. The man who saw him was, was a Zionist. He didn't even meet anybody else. Special, elite. Then he went to this town where um, there were a lot of, um, you know, sort of a, a, an intellig Zionist intelligence elite group. The, the Georgian Russians had, because um, most of the intelligence people for a long time were Zionist mm -hmm. in, in the Soviet Union and in, in Germany. And, and uh, I don't know, but I know that they recruited a lot of boys at Eton and places like that um, homosexually in England. Um, and then a lot of them went to the Soviet Union uh, after the doctor's plot or something that I think Stalin thought that the Jewish doctors were after him or something. So in 1952, a lot of them had to go away and uh, they had some sort of a, a change or whatever. But what's interesting is that a lot of this played into Georgia's, tied into my husband because he was in the place, the Mecca, for the Jewish intelligence um, or the Zionist intelligence mm -hmm. people in Princeton. All of the movie actors, you know, the uh, movie moguls or whatever, mm -hmm. they started out in Princeton. <coughs> the psychological uh, operations crowd from the Nazi, the um, whatever, they came to Princeton. And, you know, of course, they, some of them went to Harvard. Mm -hmm. and, and they spread out from there, Oppenheimer and... Uh, I mean, you know, it's very interesting. That's where a lot of them were in Princeton. And he was there, uh, of course, um, well, I mean, he was born in 37. He lived in, born in Atlantic City, then they moved to Lawrenceville. But his grandparents lived outside of Princeton. So he had a tie with um, his grandparents. But then his grandparents wound up moving out to California, so he was really abandoned from the time he was 13. And, of course, being under the influence of, of um, Charles Caddock, who was the bodyguard for the Saudis, a la teacher. And he controlled the power in the school. Hmm. The Cheeseboro, Headmaster Cheeseboro, of course, gave Charles Caddock carte blanche. Why? because the Saudis bought a big mansion called Russell House. Caddick was there with the Saudis all alone, and my husband was there part of the time. They would go on outings using Saudi money. I mean, my husband was taught to fly a plane. He was taught to shoot. They went on these, they would get nude and run in the woods kind of thing. Um, um, even at Princeton, his um, roommates told me that he would go out with these men. And when his first roommate said, because he, he really likes George, and George is a really handsome, I think, a little older now, but in, in those days he was very handsome. And uh, his roommate of the first two years and who had been at the Hun said that... Um, he had a relationship with a French teacher who was um, a count or whatever from Paris, who was kind of a teacher's aide, who helped him write his paper, and who knew uh, Camus. In other words, there was a group, this young French teacher, who liked my husband a lot and helped him with, with his thesis, mm -hmm. was also a friend of an older French teacher who was a 
very good friend of Camus. And Camus was coming over to see him Camus. when he was ma married. Camus is? Albert Camus is uh, an existentialist writer who believed in murder and, you know, um, sabotage. And the end that justifies any means. Yeah, and he was also an Arabist. They were, you see, Lawrence of Arabia, this group stuff was started by this small group of Kabbalists who were trying to take over the oil. So what they would do would be to find these sheiks and, and find whichever <coughs> one would, would go along with whatever. Well, the Brits were more interested in um, finding somebody who was fair, you know, not necessarily like that. You know, they, but then there was a guy named Moose who was in the American State Department who tried to, they, they wound up, um, the Americans wound up poisoning this Caddock, got in with the, the Saudi royal family, the, the older, the other brother, who wound up getting it. They had a, a house in Switzerland. Uh, the Saudi royals had a big, you know, big mansions on the, uh, as Les Rose is the place where Charles Caddock died, I understand. And my husband, according to the roommates, one in particular, who said, George never lost track. He always kept up with Charles Caddock. Well, Charles Caddock only died in, what, 1995, 1994. I only heard of him as a teacher in the first three years of marriage. But when was he writing Charles Caddock? He was writing him, you know, Charles Caddock and, and, and uh, Robinson, um, um, Robinson, I can't think of his name now. Um, you probably will tomorrow. Alexander Robinson. Alexander Robinson. Was a Marine, very handsome, young, went to the Hun school, and was in Saudi Arabia, in these places, came fresh from there to the Hun school. Columbia, went to Columbia University as a history major, which is a, a, an intelligence school. Columbia is a, a school where, um, you know, for example, Nussbaum went, who, who was across the hall from Vince Foster. Um, I believe Ezra Pound went there, but in other words, Ezra Pound knew too much, so they just put him in St. Elizabeth's Hospital. Right. And it was a wonderful Virginian who got him out. You know, in the movie uh, JFK, yeah. there's a scene where it shows uh, this homosexual... You've seen the movie JFK? Mm -mm. Oh, okay, well, I, I presume yeah. too much. But there was a scene involving uh, uh, Ferry and... Uh, who's the other guy in New Orleans? That, uh, David Ferry and, and um, Clay Shaw. Clay Shaw. Clay Shaw was OSS. He was also in intelligence, and he was homosexual. Yeah. And uh, they did dress up. They were in that movie, yeah, in complete drag and a real weird thing. And um, I'm sure that struck a lot of people as, as very odd that these people would be homosexual like that. But that actually, the movie, very. Um, I'll have to see that. Evidently, very frankly, brought that across. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, what's interesting to me is this book, The Widows. Um, has four spies, double agents, who work for the United States and Soviet satellites or whatever who um, were murdered. And they work for the sort of the Navy and the Army. And one of them was a man who was murdered outside of um, the, the Army's uh, intelligence headquarters outside of Washington and in a Holiday Inn, I think it was. And just before he was murdered, he called his wife back in El Paso and said, the army is going to kill me. They're going to kill me. Well, he was murdered, and the army did kill him. 
Now, this is a fictional account, or this no, really happened? No, it actually happened. Oh, I, I was saying the book The Widows is not fiction, then. Oh, no. It's, it's all. The Golitsyn, the spy Golitsyn was in there. Um, there, were, there were a couple of others. Uh, Paisley, who was murdered almost like this other man. In a, he, Paisley was murdered like William Colby. Paisley was also hanging around with homosexuals. He went to the Rush River Lodge. He, that is the one. So did Bob Woodward. Bob Woodward, you know. The reporter? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Henry Kissinger was a well-known, um, totally a homosexual, not even both ways. Um, and so it, his wife is a marriage of uh, Oh, it's just a convenience. convenience. Yeah, and he might, you know, maybe he's discovered women in his late, late age. I don't know. But, um, no, I, I heard through the, the, a very well-grounded German that, that Henry's best friend's father told Henry to stay away from him, and that's why Henry left. The family were embarrassed, and Henry, Henry went to Britain where they did this and then changed his name from Heinz to Henry. Um, and I interviewed um, a man named Bob who's uh, an Army enlisted person who uh, told me about Henry in Cambodia. So he, up through um, Cambodia, he was, he was actually raping young men. And of course, it, that experience destroyed the lives of, of these five young men, according to the source. Mm. I mean, he, he said he was crying and this man is, was a perfectly wonderful, functioning, young married man who worked for a newspaper on the Eastern Shore and had three young children, went to, to Vietnam as an enlisted man, was put in Cambodia, which he said he was, it was a lie living there, and then ran into Henry Kissinger, or Henry Kissinger ran into him and did certain things to him invited him into his tent with some other men. It was horrible, but it was, you know, he said it's wartime and um, so forth. But he said, you know, it, I could have taken it mentally if it had been a bunkmate or something. But he said, when it's someone like Henry Kissinger who does it to you, you're ruined. He said, I could never, he said he came back home. Oh, and this is interesting, and I really believe that, that Bob's right. He said, Kissinger said to him, if you ever tell anybody, if you ever mention a soul, this is the, it's the end of you. Don't you ever tell anybody. Well, when he got back, when Bob got back, um, he went to a special hospital, and they were going to keep him locked up forever. Bob. Bob. A lot of the other boys just, you know, I, my feeling is that, that he was flagged the way I was flagged when General Gray and, you know, Wilhelm had me flagged because I broke up the go-go dancing mm -hmm. in the officer's club. I was labeled a troublemaker because I thought it was wrong for married men to be going out with, with topless go-go dancers in the officer's club dining room, and I took pictures of it, and my husband, you know, got really mad and so forth. And these pictures today are still with you or they're missing? Oh no, my husband, what happened, I had the pictures, um, I risked my life because he tried to grab the camera from me. I hid it in the women's bathroom and uh, he tried to get it from me. We had a terrible fight that night. He wanted the pictures and um, I mean, I prevailed. I developed the pictures, wrote a very nice southern letter, sent a the letter, wrote the letter to the uh, club manager saying I didn't think it was proper, sent, the, had, had three sets, actually four sets the, of, the, of the three photographs I took made, and um, I sent a, a copy of the letter and the photographs to the base commander's wife and to the commandant's wife, and it stopped. But I, I was flagged, so I know, and, but this was before tail hook. And yet, instead of being congratulated for helping family values, for standing up for the wives, for showing the Marine Corps the proper place 
to have nudity and debauchery is not in the dining room of Camp Lejeune. And my husband said, well, if you, this is nothing compared to Okinawa. You just have to get used to it, he told me. Now, I was a colonel's wife. These were young majors, and they were seeing me being talked down to. What do you think it did to them? It demoralized them. The Marine Corps was demoralized. The wives were demoralized, and I did, I did what was right, what Jesus Christ would have done. How can they call themselves Christians and condone, how can Al Gray and, and Wilhelm and Cook and, and my husband condone this kind of behavior and flag me as a weirdo? Mm -hmm. So there's something, and I, that's where I'm standing. I'm standing on, on what I know Jesus Christ would have done. And if they want to, uh, you know, continue to hound me because I'm telling truth, well, that's, that's just the way it is because I'm not going to lie and, and develop a different kind of personality just to please them. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, that, that, that happened. Well, it's certainly honorable. Now the, so then the, uh, the book, The Widows, yeah. uh, continues with... Yes. Uh, yes, and I contacted this woman. There was a detective who had to be hired. She knew he'd been murdered. The Army covered everything up. She uh, had an independent investigator. And the interesting thing which happened was that she worked in a toy shop. This isn't in the book. She mm -hmm. told me this over the phone. This is Mrs. Yeah. Uh, his, it's like Klein. Oh, well, anyway. So. Yeah. Um, Anyway, he's, he's a, I'll, I'll think of it in a minute, okay. hopefully. But she worked in a toy shop, and they were scoping her out. And the, this was just after the, um, no, no, it was before he was murdered. It was before he was murdered, because she said she told her husband about this. George Bush and his wife came into her shop. And we're looking at her. Why? Now, I don't know what that means, but they don't live in El Paso. Why? And he was doing all of the Russian, Mexican, Trotsky kind of work for... George Bush. George was. Bush. No, no, this guy. This guy was. Yeah. And this is while Weapon George sales. was CIA director? Right. I believe he, yes, I believe he was... CIA director then. But the interesting thing to me was that why would he scope the wife? Why would he bring Barbara in? You know, did Barbara know? Was he just using Barbara as a, you know? But she was being observed. Mm. And it was shortly before he was murdered. And, and I know that Parker Host my husband's friend has dealings with George Bush. So, um, I don't know. I know there's a lot to do with oil and Aramco and, um, you know, Texas and, and all of that. Um, I know it's very complex, but where I draw the line is, is murder and assassination and corruption and lies and deception and cruelty to innocent women and children and families just because they're not elite. Mm -hmm. Just because now Mrs. Bush is in the Colonial Dames, so is my mother. Colonial but Dames? What colonial is Dames. It's a, uh, Colonial Dames is a very elite group of uh, women, they, they think they are, who are descendants of George Washington's aides. Oh. And they have, they own George Washington's ancestral home, uh, Saulgrave Manor in Great Britain. They run, um, Wil they have Wilton in Richmond, which is an old house where Lafayette visited. I know there's a connection with Lafayette and the Masons. 
And I know there's a big Mason contingent in the warfare selling group because the head admiral in Norway, mm -hmm. um, Igum, no, I think it, no, 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 not Igum because he he was he's in charge of the prisons, which have the drug lord. He's running the drug lord out of his prison, and he's a friend of Georgia's, Newt Igum. They were talking about this as though I, I would know about it, you know. Um, and and he, live, he has a house or a cottage right outside of Kolsas, Norway, which is where they have their underground, one of their underground bunkers. Hmm. They have one in Narvik, and um, they do a lot of the cold weather training, NATO does up there. But um, I know they're doing weapon shipments out of Norway. Okay, we'll call this a wrap for. I'm tired. <laughs> you have done a stellar job.